Gadgets, uh, IoT, robotics, and uh, some autonomous driving stuff. So about the study, uh, this actually started off as my bachelor's thesis. I have been interested in open source, and I'm very fascinated about the fact that it's an open and transparent way of developing products. And at the same time, we have crowdfunding, which is also a transparent and open way, but of monetizing. So the idea behind it was, what's up with them? Uh, can they be combined, or, or what's going on with them? Um, and uh, worth noting is also that this study actually got accepted to the 12th Open Source Systems Conference in June. So I will go a little bit over the background so we can all be on the same page. Uh, just clarify some key terms, uh, let you know what these results that you're going to hear, are, what are they applicable for, and so on. So, very key terms, open source, uh, we know it's code, or rather source, that can comprise software and hardware products that can be reused, accessed, uh, redistributed, sold, and so on, so on, for any reason. Crowdfunding, collective form of monetizing or bringing funds together for a product, usually by small amounts. Uh, communities we refer to as uh, virtual communities, communities of practice, and so on. Now, what is the main difference between uh, uh, open source software and open source hardware? For us, at least, uh, is that uh, in the hardware case, the design is open, so not really the physical object. The physical object is still out of, not protected by any license maybe patents. Uh, so the design is open in software, the code is open. But the main difference is that on hardware, fabrication is not free. So you always have to pay something to create the physical object. While in software, it's most likely free or the costs are like the power that your computer spends. Here I would like to take... Uh, it's sad that uh, Paul is not in the uh, room because uh, in another tricky part is how do you make a pull request in a, in a hardware project? How do you verify? How do you make a discussion? Somebody would have to either review your schematics, but it could be also the layout of your board, and then what? They would have to manufacture your board, you would have, you would have to do it for them. So the pull request, this feedback loop, it, it's, it's much larger in the hardware. Uh, but let's say the main problem is this, that fabrication is not free for hardware. So the projects we're going to look to, uh, we have overall classified the open source projects based on their uh, customer applicability and their uh, relative importance. 
So we saw that most crowdfunding projects out there, but especially the ones we looked into, uh, they were rather targeting a very narrow market segment, let's say makers and hackers. So we have classified them as of uh, low customer applicability. They were not mainstream projects for anybody. It was still developer friendly, uh, very tech literate people. And they could be either low profile niche or high profile users, uh, depending on how important they are. So the results you're going to hear about later on are for these kind of products. We might be able to generalize them, but uh, we would need more research. A little bit on, by, on the methodology by Patricia. So we were guided by three research questions. The first one was the characteristics of an open source crowdfunding campaign. The second one was the relationship between the campaign organizers and the community. And the last one was about um, the impact that the community had on the campaigns. And in order to do that, we interviewed 30 people who either uh, had one or more open source crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, and they usually looked like that. So they weren't only founders, they were also developers and campaign organizers or campaign managers, uh, meaning that they, it was usually a one man show. And uh, if you look at these uh, logos here, we were lucky enough to have some big ones like Arduino like uh, Esperino and even um, uh, MicroPython, which I heard that you had a workshop on yesterday. So shortly about the details on the crowdfunded products. Most products in this study, they're physical, so they have a hardware element. But this was also the case in general. Most open source crowdfunded products, uh, they were physical. Uh, in our case, both hardware and software are open source. So I'm going to go briefly over the results. So let's talk about the characteristics, the distinct characteristics of open source products being crowdfunded. Uh, the first question we ask people, and I think uh, we have some people from your line here who would also be interested to talk about them about this is why did they choose crowdfunding? So there were some common patterns and these are the most uh, significant ones. So let's say first they, they, they wanted to get uh, feedback, they wanted to inspire other people through the source of the product. Uh, and aside of inspiring, you raise awareness. So for example, uh, like Arduino did with embedded systems or uh, with the Internet of Things with some Ruby tag, I remember, and, uh, Cane for computing for children. Um, but another one was they wanted to give back. They, they had used uh, sources, they had used help of the community, they had used so many open source schematics that are there, they had used so many open source libraries. So they actually felt that the need to give back. And of course, another main reason was that the, the target group, they often expect open source, which is very important. So if you're making a development board, it's probably a good idea to make as much of it open so others can not just use it to make a proof of concept, but reuse it to make an actual commercial product. Um, again, community expected it, but it was also very appealing to it. So they, they saw, they, the community found out that adopting a bottom-up funding process, they, they saw it as not being so commercial, even though it might have been. But they, they found it very appealing to them. They, they thought, oh, it's cool. They, they, they don't go to behind closed doors to gather the money. They come to us directly and ask to fund their dreams in a way. Um, open source, the fact that they were open source, gave them more publicity, uh, especially among the target group. So many tech blogs and so, so on, perhaps they mentioned it more. Some websites like Hackaday, Hackster, and so on, they mention it more because it's open source, so we should promote it. And of course, they found out that releasing a source inspires people, makes them inspire, gives them a bit, hires the feeling of belongingness, makes this goodwill uh, approach, which uh, we saw that was very important. People kept mentioning you have to be nice. People, it's the it's the essence of the campaign that you have to be nice to them and so. Um, finally, for many of them, 
the, especially the ones that were more tech related or more le low level tech. For many of them, crowdfunding was basically the only option. They could not get money from uh, venture capitalists because uh, they, they saw open source either as, what is this, this is not professional, or even negatively, they, they, they found open source or they viewed open source as a way to devaluate their uh, IP, their intellectual property. Uh, also, they were very afraid of, hey, what if somebody beats you to the market? They, a bigger company or a company from China will just take your stuff, will make a clone, and then what do we have? What did we pay you? Nothing. Um, the final, in this case, it was a positive uh, <laughs> attribute that having a dedicated, or um, not the dedicated, but uh, a passionate community early on in the process makes crowdfunding a rather safe choice because you already have the crowd so they're gonna probably give you money for it so overall it was a very good option and perhaps in some cases the only one as you can see from uh, this graph the source is often released uh, just before the end of the campaign or after the campaign and the reasons given for this is like the matrix said they don't want to be beaten to the market uh, they want to ensure a mature and bug-free code. They want to create suspense. That is, they want to make people excited, and they want to attract more backers. But uh, what about copycats? I mean, weren't they afraid of being copied? This is actually interesting because uh, some people saw this as a as a threat to their profitability and their reputation, while others saw this as a form of success because. They were so good that people wanted to copy them. And I don't know how all of these wanted to minimize the threat. And uh, doing that, they strengthened the relationship to their communities because a loyal community is less likely to uh, back a clone. Um, another approach that sorry, another approach that some had to some had to this was that they actually didn't release the hardware source at all. So this is uh, a little bit sad for or challenging, not maybe not sad for us software developers. So people overall expected software to come for free. They, many kept saying, yeah, if you make just software, don't expect people to be so willing to pay for it. Um, and this was again a recurring theme. So many were saying, if you want people to fund your product, yeah, you better have some hardware elements. I believe that was the case I think the quote uh, on the right is from the guy who made the MicroPython. And if I'm not terribly mistaken, his crowdfunding campaign included a development board to go along with his uh, Python to basically C library. Uh, so even he, he made the software library, but he just gave the hardware on the side so people will actually pay for it. Uh, so Generally, is people like open source, but at the same time, they don't really want to pay for software. They ex expect it for free. So it makes you think that um, people want to pay for stuff that they would have to pay for anyway, regardless of if the, because hardware products, you would have to pay for them, period. So it makes you wonder about, uh, yeah, but, mm. but what gives us, for us software people, it makes it, it creates an opportunity is that people wanted to pay or either hardware or more specifically services. So you can make a nice software platform and maybe make a cloud service along with it and uh, people don't have a problem paying for that. A little bit about the relationship uh, between crowdfunding campaign, campaign managers and uh, communities. So overall they saw it as a way to test uh, the product marketability. Uh, they they use the community as a way of like direct feedback, like a constant feedback loop, contributions or feedback. It could be not necessarily in code, but it could be also ideas and usability remarks. Um, another thing, at least uh, in the beginning of uh, when Patricia was telling me about, uh, I thought that you really had to make sure that the community was formulated around your product. So a very dedicated community if you have product X, there is like an X community that talks about this continuously. Apparently this was not really necessary, this was not the case. You could utilize the more, let's say, surrounding communities that are around and just, they use your product. 
in their in their applications, but they don't have to devote their whole time around it. Uh, so it was most cases, yeah. There were some cases they already had the community before the campaign, but in most cases there was never a community around the product. So I think it's actually a good thing that you don't have necessarily to strive to create a very hardcore, passionate group around your product. People can just reuse your product and make other cool stuff. Is that me? Oh. So, uh, the communication channels used were uh, both online and offline, with online being mainly uh, Facebook and Twitter, and uh, of course the updates on crowdfunding platforms. And offline, it was conferences like this one and Makerfair. Overall, they found out that offline communication, despite being very useful and very satisfying, it did take a lot of time, so they didn't suggest doing it during the campaign, because you're very busy with other things. Um, so, some characteristics. A recurring theme again, family-like. Being nice was a very strong theme. Yes, you have to be nice to them, you have to treat them well, you have to show respect, give uh, credit, especially for code contributions. Um, and in the end, you end up with the customers not identifying as customers, but as part of your project, part of your family. So, some more on the impact of the community on the campaign. Super. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. So, overall, open source was not the core marketing point. So, they preferred to market towards a broader audience and ease them in into the more technical stuff. Um, mainstream media were not really excited or they, they seemed indifferent towards open source. So, they either didn't care or they didn't know what was about it. Um, another thing was the campaign organizers, they had to make sure that the community norms and what the community expected was in line with what the business, uh, the business model and so on. So by making sure that these two entities, communities and the crowdfunding campaign were aligned, we see that there was a big impact on the campaign itself. And that was my job. Uh, the community impact on the product then. Um, the earlier you open source the product, the comparatively more contributions you will get. So there could be contributions in form of suggestions, feedback, bug, or even code. In the maturity state, clearly that listening to user feedback is vital for the success of the product in this case. Community impact on business then. And most of them, they wanted to create a line of product. Um, that is a small ecosystem. And in order to do that, they had to, oh, they realized that the community was really important um, to, to build a sustainable and long lasting uh, line of products. Additionally, what we found really interesting is that the business decision to go open source was uh, usually and, and uh, often taken because of the community itself, because they expected the product to be open source. So we end up with this uh, model uh, that we want to bring forward and propose. That is, the three entities, crowdfunding, open source, and uh, communities, they are so entangled, they are so tightly coupled, that once you end up developing a hardware, or sorry, a hardware yeah, niche product, you probably will have to open source it, so to satisfy the community, and you probably need the community, because you want feedback and the support. And then if you have these things, it's probably your crowdfunding is the only option to monetize it. So there is this vicious circle uh, that uh, once you get into it, you have to do all these thing, this things. So this is our main uh, suggestion uh, from this study. And um, we really look forward to verifying it also from the uh, users and the backers perspective. So overall, <coughs> Open source and crowdfunding, they serve uh, common pillars, that is the communities. Um, they, they always, co campaign organizers, they found communities very important. They saw it very, uh, they consider it very significant to develop a family-like relationship with them. So they increase belongingness and they, they believe they are part of the product. Um, some follow-up research. So what does the community think about this? So do this investigate this topic from the community perspective and finally what are the characteristics of open or crowdfunding campaigns sorry crowdfunding platforms that would facilitate 
such open source projects. I don't know if we have time, um, but uh, feel free to contact us. We will make these uh, questions available online. Uh, Johan, it's or we can take questions while you're getting set up. Change the speaker if you want yeah. to. Everyone, please. Mm -hmm. So the reason for this is that we opened up the, the Sunday, which meant that some of our speakers couldn't actually speak on Sunday. That's why we have this this single, very condensed slot. But thank you very much for making it.